after he's been tagged in multiple social media posts about this drive through, this shooting. And Mr. Demons responds very succinctly, I did that. Shh. Rapper YNW Melly, facing the possibility of the death penalty for the murders of his two lifelong friends and YNW members. A lawyer who's won an acquittal for a famous rapper charged with a serious crime is here with his take. Welcome to Sidebar here on Law and Crime. I'm Anjanette Levy. We're in the third week of the YNW Melly murder trial, and it appears the state is nearing the end of its case. Melly faces two counts of first-degree murder for the October 2018 murders of his two friends, Chris Thomas Jr. and Anthony Williams. They were known as YNW Juvie and YNW Sack Chaser. The jury has seen a lot of circumstantial evidence in this case. Joining me to discuss this case is somebody who is experienced in representing high-profile rappers. He is Fred Perry. He is a defense attorney based in Philadelphia, and he has actually won an acquittal for the rapper Benny Siegel in an attempted murder case. And he also represented the rapper Cassidy years ago in a murder case where he was later found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. So uh, Fred Perry, welcome to Sidebar. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you. First off, uh, are there any unique challenges in representing high profile rappers, people who are known to the public and then are charged with very serious crimes? Uh, what I found is in any media case, media, you know, a case that has a tremendous amount of media attention, like some of those cases that I handled, um, sometimes the jury pool gets a bit tainted um, with the reputation of hip hop artists and rappers and the things they talk about um, in their music and 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 their songs, um, and you know sometimes you have to overcome that that issue. Interesting. Um, did that come up in your cases? That hasn't come up in this case in the Melly case just yet. We haven't heard about the music per se, but did the music come up in the cases with Benny Siegel and uh, Cassidy? Well, with the the Beanie Siegel case, um, there was an argument made by the prosecution to introduce some of the lyrics um, from some of his music where he was talking about carrying guns and shooting people and selling uh, bricks of cocaine and things like that. And we were able to argue successfully to keep that out of the case. Mm. Um, And I simply made the argument that, you know, if Robert De Niro or Al Pacino or Marlon Brando was charged with shooting someone Would they introduce scenes from the Godfather, um, you know, to support the theory of the case. And fortunately, the judge ruled in our favor on that case. That's a really good argument, actually. And I know it's been really controversial. <laughs> uh, you know, it's true, though. I mean, would you do that? <laughs> Probably not. You know, Marlon Brando on trial, you're not going to pull up, you know, Godfather 2 or Godfather 1, I should say. Uh, and right. and t- show him talking to Michael or whatever. Uh, okay, so let's look at the Melly case, per, you know, specifically. So far, um, what what are you thinking of what you're seeing with the evidence in the Melly case? Well, I, I think the the biggest problem the defense is going to have, from what I've seen with with the evidence that has been presented and, and may be presented in the future, is that there seems to be some type of a a cover up initially. Um, you know, creating a fake scene where this incident occurred. Um, I think I think uh, Melly has said in a, in a statement or someone has said that he wasn't in that vehicle uh, when the shooting occurred. And then they find video of him actually leaving the recording studio and getting in that vehicle with the two decedents and the co-defendant. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, oftentimes when defendants try to cover up what they've done, um, it becomes more of a conscious knowledge of guilt. Um, and really assist the prosecution. And and I think that's an interesting point you make because we have Cortland Henry Bortland, YNW Bortland, who gave a statement to law enforcement at the hospital uh, saying, um, you know, Melly wasn't in the car. I showed up and I showed up at the hospital with my two friends, GV and Sack Chaser. But we have the surveillance footage showing them leaving the recording studio. And Melly is clearly... In the back seat of that vehicle, in the driver's side, um, they leave at like two nineteen a.m. He's in the driver's side back seat, and then you know, uh, you know, less about two hours later or so, they show up, or I, I should say, Bortland shows up at the hospital 
with the two victims in tow. So then they've got the cell phone evidence to go along with that. So that to me is a huge hurdle to get over this initial lie. And yeah, that, and then when you look at the forensic evidence that, that, you know, has been uncovered in the case, they looked at blood spatter. um, They looked at bullet trajectory um, to find, you know, where the origin of the initial shots or the, the, you know, the, the kill shot, so to speak came from. And it looks like it came from that, uh, left side uh, rear seat of the vehicle where he was in fa- where he had gotten into the car. Now there's no question there's a lot of circumstantial evidence here in this case and and you know circumstantial evidence alone can can lead to a conviction in in a murder case and has done so and I've I've handled cases where we had nothing but forensic circumstantial evidence and the you know the problem from the defense perspective when you have circumstantial evidence if you can't present expert testimony to rebut the prosecutor's circumstantial evidence of criminal activity, um, then you're basically swinging at shadows because there's nobody to cross-examine. You can't call anybody a liar. So you can only challenge how this evidence was recovered, chain of custody, how it was tested, were those procedures proper. And again, if you don't have your own expert, you know, you're kind of just, you know, chasing, you know, chasing wind. Yeah. And we we think that they will. Uh, we have a to take a peek at the defense witness list. I mean, they're definitely going to put on a case. Uh, we're nearing the end of the state's case right now. Uh, one thing that I find um, kind of damning and, you know, I'm sure the defense for Melly will say, well, it's not damning for Melly. It's damning for Bortland is the fact that they photographed Bortland at the hospital. He claims to have been involved in a drive by shooting. However, he doesn't have any blood on him. He doesn't have a scratch on him. And I understand that a lot of these shots uh, in the so-called drive-by came from the passenger side. So obviously it would have hit the passengers first. But we've got a vehicle with the back window blown out, uh, windows blown out everywhere, bullet holes riddle the outside of it from the passenger side. Does it seem unrealistic to you that Bortland would show up at the hospital and be photographed and not have a scratch on him after going through such a violent incident. It would be it would be completely unreasonable for him to have not a scratch on him when he arrives at the hospital. As as you've indicated, it sounds like they've portrayed this violent scene of multiple shots being fired into this car, significant amounts of blood in the car. Um you know, and you add that, the fact that he has no injuries whatsoever, obviously is problematic for him, but again, may not be so for, for Melly, but it's certainly problematic for him. Mm-hmm. And then you take it a step further and law enforcement actually went to the area where they said this drive-by occurred and they didn't find that they didn't find any, any uh, forensic evidence at the scene. Um, they actually found a shell casing inside their car, inside the car where the decedents were actually shot. So uh, I, I think it's 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 damning evidence. Hmm, interesting. Uh, one of the witnesses that has gotten a lot of attention in this case is Felicia Holmes. She is the mother of Mariah Hamilton, who was dating Melly at the time. And, you know, she had given a prior statement to law enforcement back in 2018, saying that Melly called her daughter uh, early that morning after the homicides, claimed he had been in a drive-by. She has since recanted that in her deposition and now is acting like she doesn't remember these things. And she was questioned as a hostile witness by the prosecution. I want to play a brief clip of that. She was questioned about money that she received from Melly via his manager. Let's take a look. Ms. Holmes, how much money has the defendant's manager given you since the October of 2018? Objection. Relevance. Which comes over? Okay, so I'll ask again. Yes, ma'am. How much money have you gotten from the defendant, Jamal Evans, manager? None. And with regards to that specific statement? Ms. Holmes, you have a from another credit union account? I just did launch credit union. Okay. And at launch credit union, you've been there for a number of years? Many years. The credit union that you've been at, it's been your account, and I won't put your account number on the record for that reason. You don't have to check to this line of questioning based on the court's ruling. Objection on its overall procedure. 
So the your testimony is that you have never been given money whatsoever. I've never been given money for personal use. Okay. So the question is, have you, how much money have you been given by the defendants? For a vacation for all of us, for, his, for him, his wife, and me, to pay for it as far as um, he gave me, he didn't give, he gave me five thousand dollars for an Airbnb, in which I gave him a thousand dollars to deposit that. Okay. So he did give me money, not for personal use. Okay. Excuse me. Can we clarify who he is, is Jameson Francois? Did you know it? Just clarify, counsel. Yeah. So it's clear. Who is Jameson Francois? He's trapped. He's Nelly's manager. And you mentioned his wife as well. Who's his wife? Um, I just go by AA. So AA and his wife. We're all good friends. So Fred. I'm kind of wondering what you think of this testimony because Felicia Holmes is, you know, she's a hostile witness. She's claiming she's been intimidated by the prosecution. Uh, she's been arrested uh, because she wouldn't come to court. Th these are all her claims. She's being treated as a hostile witness. She's received money from Melly's manager. There are Instagram messages in which, you know, she's talking about, you know, she should have gotten money or something to this effect. I mean, does it make Felicia Holmes look like a liar or is the jury, in your opinion, going to believe that, you know, she was pressured to make a statement making, uh, you know, Melly look bad? Well, you know, when you're selecting jurors in these types of cases, you ask jurors to bring their common sense with them, um, you know, their life's experiences to size up a witness's credibility. Um, I looked at, at, at the testimony. Her credibility was terrible as far as I was concerned. It looked to me like she was just trying to get out of the initial statement that she had made to, to law enforcement, which was a problem for Melly. Um, and it gets, it gets back to what I said before, the cover up is, is the problem when you start covering up and trying to pay witnesses and have witnesses recant what they said. Um, I think that's going to be a problem for them. And she was also questioned about a statement that she made saying Melly would pay her to quit her job and it all turned out to be a lie. So, Ms. Holmes, is it your statement testimony that you never stated the promises that were made to us by YMW for me to quit my job and they would take care of us were all lies? They didn't want us talking with prosecutors, but now they've all disappeared. You never said that before. I don't understand. Like Objection, that. Your Honor. Move for a mistrial. That to me, I was wondering, you know, if you're a juror and you're seeing what somebody says in an Instagram message based on, you know, versus what she's saying on the stand, are, are, am I really to believe that you're lying in an Instagram message? That's 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 what we ask the jurors to do. Bring your common sense. And that's going to be the prosecution's argument. Why would you lie in an Instagram message? It makes no sense. There are some text messages uh, from Melly in which he is asking before the homicides, he's asking for somebody, this is within two weeks of the homicides, to find him a glizzy or a glock. So let's take a look at that. Uh, states in North Carolina getting ready for for this show. Um, obviously, he's taking up the C in North Carolina, he's replacing it with a big B. Okay. And then the response from the... 5054 bang number. Just, oh, I, I'm about to I'm about to head to Gotti's concert at SQL. I was just checking in on you, blood. Okay. On page 17, October 14th of 2018. Can you read that one and then explain what it's meaning? 9807 number asks, you know someone selling a glizzy? Uh, glizzy is a slang term for uh, a Glock. Okay. Then continuing on to the next page on page 18, what is the 9807 asking at, again, October 14th, 2018? He again asks, without putting a question mark, but any gun, basically saying he'll take any gun. Okay. So, Fred, before the homicides, he's looking for a Glock. OK, um, we don't know the exact type or whatever of Glock, but he he's looking for any handgun. Uh, then all of a sudden we have a double homicide. We can't find a murder weapon uh, after the homicides. Then he's asking his mother 
for a Glock. So is this incriminating at all? Or could this just be coincidental that a rapper and a guy uh, wants a gun? He wants to carry a gun for protection before the homicides and then obviously after the homicides. Or or do you think this looks bad for Melly? I think it looks bad for him. But what else is the defense going to argue? They're going to argue that um, the defense is going to say that he could he could have wanted a gun for any number of reasons, for his own protection, of his home, of his family, of himself. Um, and then maybe afterwards, when he saw that friends of his, associates of his, were in fact murdered, he wanted to have a gun for his own protection. But I still think it's not a good look for him. Yeah, it, it kind of looked like it could possibly be um, him looking for a gun before the homicides. I think a reasonable juror could see that looking for a gun to carry out the homicides and then possibly looking for a replacement afterwards. Because he because he got rid of the gun after, after the shooting. That's the argument. Another thing that uh, the state is relying heavily on in this case is the fact that uh, the victims in this case, according to the medical examiner, suffered fatal gunshot wounds, but then fatal uh, suffered other gunshot wounds after they were already dead. Let's take a look at some of the ME's testimony. The first injury to the head, what's it? Back of the, back of the head was the fatal injury, right? So in this case, that's the fatal injury because the other two, he was dead when they were okay. inflicted. So uh, this person, when he received the other two injuries, was already deceased. Correct. Did not suffer any pain from those two injuries. He's already dead. Fair enough. So Dr. McDougall is essentially saying that these victims, at least one of them, was shot after they had already died. This plays into the state's theory that the drive-by never happened, that it was staged. Uh, do you? Th how did you think the ME came across on the stand? I think the, the medical examiner came across well um, and, and presented, um, you know, pathological evidence that I think is going to be a problem for the defense because it gets back to what I said before. The, the strongest argument for the prosecution is the cover-up. This is more evidence of a cover up after after a, a, a murder is, is committed. So I think that's that's going to be the prosecution's argument. You know, if you're the defense in this case, what do you do? I mean, if you you are looking at this case and sizing this up, what what is your strategy? What is your tactic? Well, uh, again, you're, you're going to have to uh, combat the circumstantial evidence with your own presentation of expert testimony to raise a reasonable doubt about the DNA, the blood spatter, the trajectory of, of the shots. And again, you don't have direct evidence of him being in that car because this hat, you know, we have it in the beginning of, you know, when he gets in the car, but, you know, a, a period of time passes before they claim this incident happens and they get, and the three of them get to the hospital. Um, so I think I just continue to make the argument that there's no direct evidence. There's no murder weapon. Um, there's no direct evidence that he's involved in this crime whatsoever. And I think that's that's what you have to argue. And hopefully you did well with jury selection. How do you explain, though, that Melly gets in the vehicle with his four YNW members who are, you know, two of them lifelong friends of him, Juvie and Sack Chaser. And then it's it, it's two nineteen in the morning. They're all in the vehicle together. There's cell phone evidence showing these people traveling together. And then all of a sudden, 435 a.m., Bortland shows up at the hospital with two dead young men in the vehicle and there's no Melly. I mean, d don't you think the defense has to explain that to the jury? Uh, you're going to have to explain it. Um, I, I, I don't know if if you have Melly testify. I don't, I don't know that you can do that because, you know, he'd have to take himself out of that car at some point before this incident occurs. Um, but I, I, I just think the case is a problem for the defense, a, a significant problem for the defense. And, you know, you know, using using a football phrase, sometimes you got to rely on a Hail Mary in these kind of cases. And maybe you, you you deadlock the jury with with one or two jurors. But this is a death penalty case, too. So I think it just it ups the ante, too. It raises kind of the pressure level. It ra it raises the pressure level. And it also gives you what is known as a death qualified jury. So you have people now on this jury that are capable of voting to impose a death penalty. So all those people that would not be capable of imposing a death penalty had to be excused from the jury panel. 
So you've got a much more conservative leaning juror here in the case. Um, so sure, the, the ante's up and, and I think the, the defense is in a significant uphill battle here. Very interesting. Uh, you know, just one final note, uh, and there was an Instagram post that the state referenced in their opening. Uh, and in this o- Instagram post, somebody is like messaging Melly, offering some condolences uh, for what has happened. And he says, according to the prosecutor, I did that. Shh. It, I mean, how do you refute that? Because I would think you'd be like, oh, my, you know, yeah, my 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 friends are dead. You know, it, it just seems kind of strange unless the guy is just blowing smoke or whatever. So how do you combat that? That's the only argument to make that he's just blowing smoke, which makes no sense whatsoever. No sense. I don't know why. If your friend was friends were killed, you would tell anyone anything close to I did that. And then shh. I, it makes no sense. Interesting. Uh, well, Fred Perry, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's been really wonderful speaking with you, and, and we hope you'll come back sometime. Thank you. Sure. My pleasure. Thank you. That's it for this edition of Law & Crime Sidebar Podcast. You can listen to and download Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, you can always watch it on Law & Crime's YouTube channel. I'm Anjanette Levy, and we will see you next time. 